where was Atlantis? If Plato knows, then he will tell. After thousands of years, so many of us still search for the answer to the mystery of Atlantis. From time to time, archaeologists and historians locate evidence. There have been many locations proposed for the location of Atlantis. Ever since the first recorded history of Atlantis, written by the Greek philosopher Plato over 2,300 years ago, debate has raged as to whether or not Atlantis ever really existed. The existence of Atlantis is supported by the fact that it is described in great details by Plato. In addition, various conditions, events and goods unknown to Plato are also described in detailed and lengthy words. Plato himself asserts, that it is a real story. The first suggested linkage between Atlantis and Indonesia came from the leading theosophist, C.W. Leadbeater, and the lieutenant governor of British Java, Thomas Stamford Raffles, in the 19th century. One of the first researchers to Atlantis there, in the mid-1990s, is the American polymath, William Lauritzen. The concept of Sunderland Atlantis was given a huge boost by the publication of the late Brazilian professor, Aracio Nunistas Santosi's book, Atlantis, The Lost Continent Finally Found, in 2005. The prehistoric flooding of the Sunderland region is covered extensively by a pediatrician and geneticist, Stephen Oppenheimer, in 1998. The Atlantology of Sunderland hypothesis is also flanked by the studies of the geologist and geophysicist, Robert M. Schock, together with Robert Aquinas McNally, in 2003. Other proponents of the Sunderland Atlantis are, Zia Abbas, Sunil Kasanin, and Danny Hillman Natavijaya. The recent knowledge of late glacial and post-glacial sea level rise, and land subsidence that occurred almost precisely at the time described by Plato, also become strong evidence to the truth of the story. Plato describes the Atlantis from point of views of geography, climate, plain layout, city layout, river and channel hydraulics, produces, social structure, customs, mythology, and its destruction in details, including their dimensions and orientations. These become the subjects of Donnie Rwanto to hypothesize that the lost city of Atlantis is in Java Sea, as written in a book, Atlantis, the lost city is in Java Sea, published in April 2015. The works include over five-year research and analysis of textbooks, papers, internet sites and digital data, collected by the author as well as some site observations. The author has made a serious effort to match Plato's narrative, with his chosen location for Atlantis, namely off the southern coast of the island of Kalimantan in the Java Sea. He also uses his professional expertise, to analyze Plato's many references to the waterways of the Atlantis capital, and its extensive plain. He commendably draws attention, to the remarkable water transportation and irrigation system in central Kalimantan. He found a lot more detailed converging evidence, summarized in a 60-bullet checklist of agreements between Plato's Atlantis and Sunderland, or Java Sea localization, as proofs that his theory is the most complete and probable until today. The story of Atlantis, comes to us from the Socratic Dialogues, Demias, and, Crishes, written by, Plato, in about 360 BC. There are four people in a meeting, who had met the previous day, in which Socrates, wants Demias, Hermocrates, and Crishes, to tell him stories about an ideal state. The first is, Crishes, who talks about his great-grandfather's meeting with Solon, one of the seven sages, an Athenian poet, and a famous lawgiver. Solon had been to Egypt, where priests talked about the story of Atlantis, which was inscribed on a pillar in their temple. Solon, while wrote his poem, inquired into the meaning and knowledge of the names, which had been translated into Egyptian, when copying them out again, translated them into Greek. Thus, 
The names in the Solon story were borrowed from the Greek myth for the Athenian people to understand. Plato describes the Atlantis, told as a real story, was a powerful and advanced kingdom that sank, in a night and a day, into the ocean, around 9600 BC, or about 11,600 years ago. It was protected by the god Poseidon, who made his son, Atlas, greater king, and namesake of the land, Atlantis. As the Atlanteans grew powerful, their ethics declined. At the end, by way of divine punishment, its capital city and island were beset by an earthquake and a flood, and sank into a sea. Plato asserts that Atlantis was located at a distant point in the Atlantic Ocean. What we call now by the name of Atlantic Ocean is not the same as that of the ancients. Herodotus, Aristotle, Plato, Strabo, and several other ancient authors are very specific on the fact that the Atlantic Ocean was the whole of the Cultureminous Earth Encircling Ocean, which we now arbitrarily divide into Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans. The phrase, at a distant point in the Atlantic Ocean, implies that Atlantis was far away in the ocean, in what we know today, the Eastern Indian Ocean, or the Pacific Ocean. Plato is alleged to have embodied the Athens as part of the story of Atlantis to show their greatest and noblest action. The story is to be an illustration of how the ideal state conducts itself in warfare against its neighbors and has to be read against the background of the Republic, another Plato's seminal work. The allegation of embodiment is supported by the expressions as follows. The state of Atlantis is located at a distant point in the Atlantic Ocean, by itself, put the city of the Athens at a distant location as well, since both regions were close together, as told in the story. The Atlantis and the Athens were bordered by pillars of Heracles, which among others, were placed in a strait, called the Strait of Heracles. The city of Atlantis was within the Strait of Heracles, meaning that the city of Athens was outside of the strait and the sea. These geographic descriptions are not compatible to the existence of Atlantis around the Mediterranean. The statements that the Athens which formerly had a vast and fertile land, at the time of Solon had sunk all around, all that remains were small rocky parts, only a few trees growing, and consists almost entirely of bare land, so that rain water flows only just on it, and then lost to the sea, do not describe the conditions of the city of Athens at the time of Solon. The statement that the city of Athens had been established a thousand years before Egypt is also incompatible. If Plato knows the location of Atlantis, which was bordering with the Athens, he would surely mention the exact geographical location from his knowledge. A vast southeastern part of the Asian continental shelf was exposed during the last glacial period, geologically named as the Sunderland. The last glacial period, or popularly known as the Ice Age, was the most recent glacial period within the current Ice Age, occurring during the last years of the Pleistocene geological era, from approximately 110,000 to 12,000 years ago. The Sunderland included the Malay Peninsula on the Asian mainland, as well as the large islands of Kalimantan, Java, and Sumatra and their surrounding island. The sea level at the time of Atlantis, about 11,600 years ago, was approximately 60 meters below the present day sea level. Plato's expression that, Atlantis was the way to other islands, and from there might pass to the opposite continent, which encompasses the true ocean, precisely points to Sunderland. Traveling further from there, one may reach some islands like, Nusatangara, Sulawesi, Malaku, Mindanao, and Luzon, and may pass the opposite continent, that was the large cell continent, combining Australia, Papua, and the land connecting them. The land of Atlantis is larger than Libya and Asia Minor, also precisely affirms its size. 
The expression that, the region on the side of the ocean was said to be very lofty and precipitous, further confirms the Sunderland location of Atlantis. The expression, inside a strait and in a sea, encircled by a boundless continent, confirms its capital location. It is said that, Atlantis had, sun in the above, benefit of the annual rainfall, abundance of water, excellently a temperate climate, and summer and winter seasons. These are strongly characterize a tropical climate. Summer and winter, refer to the dry and wet seasons, which were non-existence words in the ancient Greece. Atlantis had, full of rich earth, abundance of wood, cultivation by true farmers, noble nature, best soil in the world, abundance of animals, coconuts, spice products, and two harvests each year. These are the true natural characteristics of the region in Sunderland. The abundance of food and wood was needed, to sustain more than 20 million population, to create more than a million soldiers, and to build more than 200 ships, which was not possible in the other parts of the world during the era. The other significant thing, Atlantis is a maritime and riverine civilization. This is also a true characteristic of the region. Atlantis had abundance of minerals, gold, silver, copper, tin, and, or I shall come. These are also true natural characteristics of the region. What is or I shall come? Or I shall come, was unknown to Greek, being more precious in those days than anything except gold, and flashed with the red light, or like fire. The author identified or I shall come as, the zircon, as they have the same characteristics as the descriptions. The zircon products are really valuable second to gold. They have gemstone quality, and are popular as diamond simulant. Zircon can be processed to bring out different colors, the red one is known as, the hyacinth. When finished, its nature is sparkling like diamond, that metals do not possess, which why Plato describes it with the words, flashed and light, in particular. No known metal, shines and flashed with the red color, or like fire, thus or I shall come in not a metal. The expression that, it was dug out of the earth in many parts of the land, is true, as it is abundant in the region of Kalimantan. Plato describes that, there was a level plain, smooth and even, it descended towards the sea, surrounded by mountains celebrated for their number size and beauty, looked towards the south and sheltered from the north, and with wealthy villages of country folk, rivers, lakes and, meadows. There was a plain near the capital city of Atlantis, matching the characteristics of the region in southern Kalimantan, in which a part is now submerged under the Java Sea. The plain has slopes mostly less than 1%, declining southward to the Java Sea, and no visible mound on the whole plain. It is open on the south, and sheltered by the Muller Schwainer and Maratus Mountains at the north, mostly covered by primary forest, inhabited by enormous kinds of animals, and as the home of tens of native Dayak tribes. It has, high rainfall and warm temperature over the year, many large rivers and tributaries, so that it is very fertile, and rich of food and daily necessity resources. Plato explains that, the plain was rectangular and oblong in shape, 3,000 stadia or about 555 kilometers long, and 2,000 stadia or about 370 kilometers wide. The shape of the plain, in the region of southern Kalimantan and the adjacent Java Sea, is rectangular at the south and oblong at the north, almost exactly 555 kilometers long, and 370 kilometers wide. Concerning the waterways on the plain, Plato describes that, the perimeter canal was 100 feet, or about 30 meters deep, one stadium, or about 185 meters wide, 10,000 stadia, or about 1,850 kilometers long, carried round the whole plain, received streams from the mountains, winding around the plain, meeting at the city and led off into the sea. The inland canals were straight, 100 feet, 
or about 30 meters wide, 100 stadia, or about 18.5 kilometers intervals, let off into the perimeter canal, and as means for transporting wood and products in ships. There were waterways on the plain, matching the characteristics of the region. Flooding and sedimentation of the rivers, on a very flat plain over the past 11,600 years, have changed the regimes. Interchanges of flows and orders among them might also occur. However, in general view, their straightness and elongation are preserved until today, that are parallel to each other, and in the north-south direction. The rivers of Barido, Kapuas Moru, Kahayan and Sebangal, found in the region, are identified as those canals. They are originated from the Muller Swainer and Maratus Mountains. These rivers are about 600 to 800 meters wide, and 8 meters deep in average. Calculating the conveying capacity, that is the area times the velocity, and assuming the same flow velocity, because of the same gravitational energy slope, the cross-section area of the flow, that is the width times the depth, as described by Plato, is about 185 times 30, equals 5550 square meters. While the area today is, amazingly almost precise, 700, in average, times 8, equals 5,600 square meters. The average distance of these rivers is approximately 20 kilometers, also considered in close agreement to the figure of 18.5 kilometers by Plato. Considering the windingness of the rivers encircling the plain, their length is almost precisely the same, that is, 1,850 kilometers. Most of the rivers in southern Kalimantan are navigable. These rivers, and all their tributaries, are a network of transportation system, become very important means for the people, and has been the economic lifeblood, because most of their economic activities are carried out through and in the rivers since the ancient time. Various types of forest, mining, and agricultural products are transported to collection points or ports, through the river network. Plato mentions that, there were transverse passages, cut from one inland canal into another, and, the irrigation streams taping from the canals, supplied water to the land in summer, or dry season, but rainfall in the winter, or rainy season, yielding two crops in a year. Looking at the maps, we can see numerous existing transverse passages in the region, some of them were built or rehabilitated in recent times. The passage is known locally as, Angier, a canal linking two rivers, as part of the transportation network. Today's practices of tidal swamp irrigation system in southern Kalimantan is, traditionally known as, the Angier system, where primary canals called, Angier, or, and Tosan, were constructed connecting two tidal rivers, also used as navigation purposes. Inland canals were built to irrigate and drain the fields, from, and, to the Angier. Secondary canals called, Hondil, or, Tata, and tertiary canals called, Sika. During low tides, the canals drain the toxic water, while during high tides, fresh water enters the canals and convey to the fields. The system yields two rice crops in a year. All these facts are completely consistent with the Plato's expressions. Plato describes that, the capital island, where there was a city, with the citadel and rings of water, was in a real sea, inside a strait, surrounded by a boundless continent. The boundless continent is, the Sundalin attached to the Asian continent, and the only sea surrounded by it in those days was, the ancient Java Sea, suggesting that, the capital island and city are located in the Java Sea. The statement that, the island was located near the plain, and all the canals met at the city and drained into the sea, suggesting that the island is located south of the plain, in a place now under the Java Sea. 
freight, for which reason, the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a reef of mud or clay in the way, confirms the location. Coral reef is scarce in the Mediterranean, so that the Greeks and the Egyptians did not own the term, then Plato wrote it as, a reef of mud or clay. Coral reefs grow best in warm, shallow, clear, sunny, and agitated waters, and on hard, underwater surfaces, thus, constitute the ideal conditions for the Java Sea. It is confirmed further by the phrase, caused by the subsidence of the island, as the growth of the coral reef was caused by the sea level rise during the last glacial period. The site is identified by the sailors as, Gosongia, or Annie Florence Reef, a coral reef described as small in extent and dries at low water. The city of Atlantis was an island, with a small hill at its center. It had rings of water and, a passage from the sea to the inner ring. They used brass, tin, and or chalcum to cover the outer walls of their cities. Poseidon's temple at the center had a barbaric appearance, and the roof interior was made of ivory. The later docks had triremes and many naval supplies. Bolian Island, off in the Java Sea is a prototype of the island of Atlantis, as it has the same environment, geological formation, and tectonic processes, as well as they are closely situated. Bolian and Atlantis Islands are both located on a geological arc, identified by the geologists as Bolian Arc. It is described that, they had springs, one of cold and another of hot water. There are several hot and cold springs in the Bolian Island, resulted from the tectonic activities in the region. That descriptions, the stones were quarried from the center island and the zones, with white, black, and red colors, and, they hollowed out double docks, having roofs formed out of the native rock, are also noticeable. The stones are apparently similar to the igneous rock deposited in the Bolian Island, having the acidic white, alkaline black red, and ferro-axide red rocks. This igneous rock is hard and strong, having enough natural strength to stand as roofs of the hollowed out double docks. What does, the Pillars of Heracles, really mean? The Egyptian priest told Solon, about the territorial boundary between Atlantis and its opponent, as, which are by you called the Pillars of Heracles, to describe a state entrance or boundary markers which were situated in a strait. The words, by you, could mean that, the markers were commonly known by the Athenian, but not necessarily what they referred to, or in other words, like the Pillars of Heracles. As mentioned before, the Atlantean boundary is not compatible with the Mediterranean region. Moreover, Solon borrows Greek mythological terms in the story. Classical Greek writers frequently refer to the pillars without being in any way specific regarding their location. The poet Pinder would appear to have treated the pillars as a metaphor for the limit of established Greek geographical knowledge, a boundary that was never static. The pillars were, in earlier times, identified with the Strait of Sicily, but from the time of Erastos thence, circa 250 BC, the metaphor was moved to refer to the Strait of Gibraltar, reflecting the expansion of the Greek maritime knowledge. The author hypothesizes that, the pillars are monuments built at places on state entrances or boundary line, and could be anywhere at certain places along the boundary. The monument is locally known as, Tugu, which has been the tradition in Indonesia until now, to mark the boundary or entrances of a region. The monuments are often decorated with gargoyle-like faces of the god Kala, which are ubiquitous in Java and Bali. It will be discussed later that the god, Kala, is analogous with the Greek, Heracles. 
Plato mentions that, the war was said to have taken place between those who dwelt outside the pillars of Heracles, and all who dwelt within them. Possibilities of the bordering markers, resembling the pillars of Heracles, are as shown on this image. The Kingdom of Atlantis was founded by a god named Poseidon, borrowed from the Greek myth. The land was divided into ten portions, given to his children. There was a holy temple dedicated to Poseidon and his wife, Theito, in the center of the citadel. Poseidon is one of the twelve Olympian deities of the Pantheon in the Greek mythology. His main domain is the ocean, so that he is called the god of the sea, who rides on sea creatures that resemble horses. In the earliest works of the ancient Greek literature, Poseidon is more widely known than Zeus, and was regarded as the supreme god, as mentioned in Linear B tablets from the pre-Olympian's Greek Bronze Age. Homer, in the Iliad, calls him as the protector of the Hellenic cities. Poseidon is analogous to Neptune in the Etruscan civilization, around the 1st century BC, which is also called the god of the sea. In Latin language, the name was transformed into Neptune, in the Roman mythology. Neptune is depicted as a god who drives sea creatures resembling dragon-tailed horses, and armed with a trident, like Poseidon. This shows the strong influence of Greek mythology. Plato explains that, the ten kings were said to have the absolute control of the citizens, by the enforcement of the law, regulated by the commands of Poseidon which had handed it down. The Greek Poseidon is analogous to, God Baruna or Waruna in the New Zentara archipelago, which given the title of the water god, the ruler of the seas and oceans. In pre-Dharmic mythology, Baruna was considered as the supreme god against the others, and the first law founder of the world. Baruna is depicted as riding a sea monster called Makara and which on the front resembling a beast, with large teeth and tusks, and on the back in the form of a giant dragon's tail, occasionally legged. In Indian mythology, the Makara is described as an inland creature in the front half, such as deer, crocodile or elephant, and an aquatic creature in the back half, such as fish or seal, or occasionally peacock's tail or flower. Of these things, the author concludes that Poseidon and Baruna are analogous, evidence that both of them are the gods of the seas or oceans, became the first law founders, constituted the supreme gods in the early time, and drive mythological sea creatures. Besides some other names, Kalimantan bore the name of Warunapura, means the land of the god Baruna. The old Javanese chronicle, Nagara Kritagama, mentions an ancient state that was within the Majapahit spheres of influence, called Barunay, later identified as Barunai, a kingdom of the modern Brunei. European sources further in the 16th century showed the name of the island as Bernay, by Antonio Pigafetta, or Bornai, by Duarte Barbosa. Chinese chronicles in the Song and Ming dynasties showed the name Boni. The Dutch and British colonials named the island as Borneo. This is another conclusion that Kalimantan or Borneo, which was once the island of the god Baruna, is analogous to the island of Poseidon, and related to the existence of Atlantis in the region. Plato mentions that, the war was said to have taken place between those who dwelt outside the pillars of Heracles, and all who dwelt within them. Heracles is a name borrowed from the Greek mythology. Heracles, or romanized as Hercules, is the son of the affair Zeus had with the mortal woman Alcmene. Zeus seduced and made love to Alcmene after disguising himself as her husband, Amphitryon, the king of Thebes. Zeus swore that, the next son born of the Perseid house should become ruler of Greece, but by a trick of Zeus's jealous wife, Hera, another child, the sickly Eurystheus, was born first and became king. When Heracles grew up, he had to serve him, and also suffer the vengeful persecution of Hera. Besides these Hera-induced frenzies, Heracles was a very brutal character. In spite of those, 
Heracles is a divine hero in the Greek mythology. He is the greatest of the Greek heroes, a paragon of strength and masculinity, the ancestor of royal clans who claim to be Heraclidae, and a champion of the Olympian order against chthonic monsters. The Greek Heracles is analogous to god Kala in the Nusantara archipelago. Kala is the god of the underworld in the ancient Javanese and Balinese mythology. Kala is also named the creator of light and earth, as well as the god of destruction who devours unlucky people. In the mythology, he causes eclipses by trying to eat the sun or the moon. According to the Javanese legend, Kala is the son of Guru. Guru has a very beautiful wife, named Juma. One day, Guru, in a fit of uncontrolled lust, forced himself on Yuma. They had sexual intercourse on top of his aunt Dini, a divine cow. This behavior was ashamed Yuma, who then cursed Guru, but Guru cursed back Yuma, so she appeared as a fearsome and, and ugly ogre. This fierce form of Yuma, is also known in Javanese mythology as Durga. From this relationship, Kala was born with the appearance of an ogre. Kala is described as having an insatiable appetite, and being very rude. He was sent by the Deva to Earth, to punish humans for their evil habits. However, Kala was interested only in devouring humans to satisfy his appetite. Alarmed, the Deva then recalled Kala from the Earth. He later became ruler of the underworld. The analogy of Kala and Heracles is that, each of them is the son of a supreme god either girl, or Zeus. Their births were outrageous. Kala was born from an uncontrolled lust of Guru on Yuma, while Heracles was from a seduction of Zeus on Alcmini. They are having insatiable appetites, and being very rude, brutal, and violent, in their whole lives. From the ancient until present day, gargoyle-like faces of Kala, are often found at temple entrances, boundary pillars, welcome monuments, gates, doorway, niches, furniture, wall hangings, and traditional musical instruments, ubiquitous in Java and Bali. Similar figures are also found at the Dayak houses. As previously discussed, the boundary monuments decorated with the Kala faces, are analogous to the pillars of Heracles. Apart from those, Zeus, the father of Heracles, and Guru, the father of Kala, are also analogous. Both of them were then appointed to the supreme gods, replacing either Poseidon or Baruna. Note also the analogy and phonetic similarities between the names. Kala and Cleos, from Heracles, and Alcleos, the first name of Heracles. Guru and Zu, the nickname of Zeus. Yuma with Alcme. And Durga with Hera. As well as Menhurs, stone tables, and stone statues, Austronesian megalithic culture and Musantara, features an earth and stone step pyramid structure, referred to as, Kundun Berundak. Kundan Berundak is regarded as one of the characteristics of the original culture of the archipelago. These structures have been found and spread throughout Musantara, as far as Polynesia. Ganin Padong is the biggest and the oldest megalithic site in Southeast Asia, dated circa 23,000 BC or older. The Saku and Chathal temples in central Java, where the dates are still debated, show the Austronesian indigenous elements of steppe pyramids, that somewhat resemble Mesoamerican pyramids. The huge Burl Buddha temple is the largest Buddhist temple in the world, which allegedly built on the previous steppe pyramid. The construction of stone pyramids was based on the native belief, that mountains and other high places are the abode of the spirits of the ancestors, or the most ideal pilgrimage places to worship them. They feel the need for pilgrimages, in addition to worship, to ask for help in solving the everyday life problems. In the development, they gave architectural decorations on the pyramids, which varies according to their cultures and beliefs. The shape of the structures then gradually transformed into temples. 
As said by Plato, the Temple of Poseidon was built in the center island, which was a hill, encircled by rings of waters. To reach the temple from the innermost ring of water, steps on the hill slope were definitely required. This could mean that the temple is featuring an earth and stone step pyramid structure, characterizes the original culture of New Zantara, that is referred to as Pundan Barundak. The temple was also the place to worship their ancestors. Plato describes that, in every five or six years alternately, the kings of Atlantis gathered to discuss and make arrangements top off with plenty of bull's sacrifice. Common people generally could not distinguish between bull and water buffalo. Plato does not recognize water buffalo, but beast resembling the bull, because the animals were not found in the ancient Greece and its surroundings. Water buffalo, also called Asian buffalo or Asiatic buffalo, is a large bovine native to Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Water buffalo is one of the animals of greatest economic and religious value, used as a sacrificial victim in Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent, and southern China. In these monsoon regions of Asia, buffaloes are offered in sacrifice to divinities or divine spirits, as the carrier of dead souls to the world beyond, or of some orphic symbol of the ancestors. A characteristic of Southeast Asian houses, is the forked horn on the roof, which is considered to be a symbol of the buffalo, regarded throughout the region as a link between heaven and this world. Plato mentions that, there were fruits having a hard rind, affording drinks, meats, and ointments in Atlantis. Those fruits are no other than coconuts. Coconut has a long and respected history among cultures in the regions of Southeast Asia, South Asia and the Pacific. DNA analysis reveals that, coconuts were first cultivated in islands Southeast Asia, meaning the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and perhaps the continent as well. Coconuts were introduced to the Indian Ocean a couple of thousand years ago, by ancient Austronesians establishing trade routes connecting Southeast Asia, to Madagascar and coastal East Africa. Coconut genetics also preserve a record of prehistoric trade routes and of the colonization of the Americas. Plato mentions that, there were fruits which spoil with keeping, with which we console ourselves after dinner, in Atlantis. This could be a traditional fermented food, eaten as a dessert, locally known as tapi, or tape. Tapi or tape is indigenous and popular throughout Southeast Asia. It is a sweet or sour alcoholic paste, and can be used directly as a food, or in traditional recipes. Tape can be made from a variety of carbohydrate sources, but typically from cassava, white rice, or glutinous rice. Fermentation is performed by a variety of molds, by inoculating a carbohydrate source with the required microorganisms, in a starter culture, locally known as ragi, and yeasts, along with bacteria. Tape is also used to make alcoholic beverages, locally known as arak, or brem. Plato mentions that, there are roots, or herbage, or woods, or essences which distill from fruit and flower. This could be the herbal medicine, made from natural materials, locally known as jammu, or mixtures of spices or seasoning, known as bumbu. There was fruit, which admits of cultivation, both a dry sort, which is given us for nourishment and any other, which we use for food. He called them all by the common name, pulse. This could be the patty or rice, which is the staple food of the region. There are chestnuts and the like, which furnish pleasure and amusement. This could be coffee, which grows well in this region. It is described that, there were a great number of elephants in Atlantis. Two of the four subspecies of Asian elephants are found in Indonesia and Malaysia. 
the Sumatran elephant is found on the island of Sumatra, and the Kalimantan elephant on the island of Kalimantan. The now extinct Javan elephant, those once inhabited Java, are identical to the Kalimantan elephant. Plato also mentions that, there was provision for all other sorts of animals, both for those which live in lakes, and marshes, and rivers, and also for those which live in mountains, and on plains, so there was for the animal which is the largest and most voracious of all. Large species, such as tiger, rhinoceros, orangutan, elephant, and leopard, exist in the region, which are among almost a thousand mammal species inhabiting this region. Besides those, there are almost a thousand of bird species, and more than a thousand of fish species. These things strengthen the Sundaland hypothesis of Atlantis. Plato mentioned that, the island of Atlantis was beset by an earthquake and a flood, and sank into a muddy sea. In some other his explanations, it is implied that the flood was coming from the sea, so the possibility is a tsunami. Plato did not recognize tsunami, so he equated it to flood. Earthquakes and tsunamis are very often correlated. The Banda Ark, a west-facing horseshoe-shaped ark in eastern Indonesia, situated west of Papua, and in the easternmost extension of the Sunda subduction zone system, defines the locus of three converging and colliding major plates, the Indo-Australian, the Pacific, and the Eurasian plates, and reveals a characteristic bowl-shaped geometry. The Banda Sea, encircled by the Banda Ark, occupies the main portion of the Banda Sea plate. Frequent and significant earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcano eruptions took place in one of the most complex tectonic region on Earth. The largest earthquakes in the world since 1900, show that the earthquake in Banda Sea on February 1, 1938 is among them. Another at least 10 occurrences of large earthquakes in this region between 17th and 20th centuries are also known. The world's deadliest tsunamis from 1650 to 2010 AD show that, three occurrences of deadliest tsunamis in the region are among them, in 1674, 1899 and 1992. Mount Kambara eruption in 1815 was the largest volcanic eruption in recorded history, caused global climate anomalies, that included the phenomenon known as, volcanic winter. Tsunami are known for their dramatic run-up heights, can also be excited or amplified in height considerably in shallow waters, and on flat plains, and can oscillate back and forth within harbors and bays. The recorded run-up of the 1674 AD Banda Sea Tsunami was 80 to 100 meters high. We can speculate that, that destruction of Atlantis was among others caused by a tsunami in this region. It was due to the tsunami waves traveling in shallow water, that was the ancient Java Sea, and penetrated inland on a very flat plain. The sea water rise was probably also contributed the occurrence of earthquakes and tsunamis, due to rapid increase of water burden on the Banda Sea Plate. The ancient Java Sea was forming a gulf, which could cause the wave became much higher and prolonged, and destructive. Overall, the author has collected 60 converging evidence to conclude that, Atlantis is matched to the characteristics of Sunderland, as well as its capital city is most likely located in the Java Sea.